Hello, everyone, and welcome to the iSystem webinar series. Today's episode is about Infineon iSystem Joint Trico Aurix webinar series session two. Use case is about debug performance bottlenecks. We will hear a short recap of the Infineon Tricore Aurix trace architecture, followed by some details about the interfaces DAP and AGPT. And then we will dive into two different use cases using WinIDEA for demonstration. My name is Sabrina Kisslinger. I'll be the moderator. Today's speakers are Matthias Marquardt of Infineon and Felix Martin of iSystem. They will lead you through the technical presentation. Matthias is field application engineer at Infineon Technologies for Aurix microcontrollers. He has a special focus on ADAS applications. And even after nine years of support experience, he is still interested in advanced debugging techniques like tracing. Hi, Matthias. Good to have you here. Thank you, Sabrina. Hello, everyone. Felix has been systems engineer with iSystem for almost four years now, and he specializes in autosub profiling and timing analysis. He helps engineers understanding and optimizing the runtime behavior of their embedded systems by utilizing techniques as software and hardware tracing. Hi, Felix. Good to have hi, you here. Hi, Sabrina. Hi, everyone. So that's it from my side. Over to you, Matthias and Felix. Hello and welcome to the second session of the Infineon iSystem webinar series, also from my side. In this part, we expand our understanding of Aurix Trace by discussing two example use cases in full detail. This webinar aims to give you the complete picture of the necessary configurations and win idea to get started with Aurix Tracing. Our first example use case shows you the steps necessary to utilize program flow trace. In the second example, we investigate faulty application behavior caused by high bus load using data tracing. In the end, you can then use these examples and adapt them to your use case. Let's take a look at the agenda. We start by doing a quick review of the Oryx trace architecture. Next. We discuss the basic WinIDEA configuration required for all Oryx Trace use cases. Extending the basic configuration, we then explain and demo the setup for the two example use cases. We end with a short conclusion and time for questions and answers. Let's start by reviewing the Oryx Trace architecture for those who haven't participated in the first webinar. First, we need to understand that not all microcontrollers, or Oryx derivatives in this case, are created equal. Infineon differentiates between production devices and emulation devices. Production devices do not have any trace capabilities whatsoever. On the other hand, emulation devices contain the so-called multi-core debug solution, MCDS. The MCDS provides all the bells and whistles that one could dream of when it comes to tracing. Three processor observation blocks, three bus observation blocks, observation blocks, plenty of trace memory, and trace support via the regular DAP or JTAG debug port, as well as the high-speed serial HTTP interface. Now to make it a little bit more interesting, there are also two options in between. Some production devices feature a mini MCDS with a single POB and 8 kilobytes of trace RAM. And there are also emulation devices with a so-called MCDS slide. The MCDS slide has two POBs, but no BOBs. Besides the missing BOBs and POB, it has the same capabilities as the full MCDS. If your current device is not an emulation device, you can use an emulation adapter to gain access to the trace. Emulation devices are functionally compatible with the non-ED devices and will not influence the behavior of your application. As a side note, the information, information on this slide is specifically for TC3XX second generation Oryx devices. However, the situation is pretty similar for TC2XX devices. Notable differences are that there's no MCDS slide 
and the full MCDS has only two POBs. Alright, with this information fresh in our minds, we can configure WinIdea for Oryx tracing. As we have seen, there are two interfaces available to record trace data. The regular DAP or JTAG debug port and the high-speed HTTP trace interface. iSystem supports DAP and JTAG with regular passive probes or the DAP active probe. The DAP active probe is the recommended solution for the DAP interface because of significantly higher clock speeds resulting in better trace performance. The HTBT Active Probe and the IC6000 support the HTBT interface. While the IC6000 has a large internal buffer, 8GB instead of 1GB, the Active Probe is the preferred option in most cases, because of its support of the FNET concept, among other reasons. We start by configuring the cycle duration, which works the same for all trace interfaces. The WinIdea analyzer needs to know the cycle duration to convert the counter-based timestamp values from the target into seconds. The cycle duration is the inverse of the MCDS clock frequency. For example, if the MCDS runs at 150, 150 MHz, then the cycle duration is 6.667 nanoseconds. If you don't know the MCDS clock frequency, you can use the Oryx Clocks plugin under View Oryx clocks to find it out. Next, we configure the operation mode. When recording a trace via the debug port, the MCDS stores the trace data in the extension memory or EMAM. More specifically, the TCM as we will see in a second. We call this method on-chip trace because the MCDS stores the trace data on chip from where the debugger reads it. Hence, the bidirectional red arrow. When I'm recording a trace via the HTTP interface, the MCDS buffers the data in the extended trace memory, XTM. From there, the HTTP controller sends the data off chip and the debugger receives the trace steam. Hence, the unidirectional green arrow. With this understanding, the configuration of the operation mode is simple. We use on-chip for the DAP interface and Aurora trace port for HTBT. Note that the HTBT interface includes the DAP pins, so we could use on-chip trace if we wanted, but it wouldn't make sense to do so because HTBT provides tremendously higher data rates. Let's take a closer look at the EMAM. As you can see, it consists of the extended calibration memory, the trace calibration memory, and the extended trace memory. When using on-chip trace, we want to use the trace calibration memory to buffer the trace data. However, there's one crucial caveat. Some applications use the TCM, for example via the signal processing unit in radar applications. The TCM ties used by the application are not available for tracing. In such cases, we can tell the MCDS to use a specific subset of tiles, assuming the application does not use all of them. Or we use the XTM, which is dedicated trace memory. In both cases, the maximum trace capacity is smaller relative to using all of the, MC all of the TCM tiles. When using HTBT, the XTM is automatically used in FIFO mode by the MCDS and no specific configuration is necessary. So for on-chip trace, we want to use TCM in 95% of the cases and XTM only if the application uses the TCM. If you have a mini MCDS, it automatically uses the TRAM. The only option for the Aurora trace port is to use the XTM in FIFO mode. WinIdea automatically makes that configuration for us. Next, we need to talk about the trace clock. Higher depth clock frequencies enable a feature called upload by sampling, which we will discuss on the next slide. When using a standard iSystem DAP adapter, 10 MHz is the maximum clock rate. You might get away with 20, but there's no real point in doing that. However, with the active probe, you can utilize clock rates of up to 160 MHz, the maximum supported by the DAP protocol, if your, if your PCB design permits it. 
I recommend starting with 100 MHz and then trying higher frequencies if needed. The HDBT interface supports 1.25 and 2.5 gigabits per second. I recommend a scientific approach to find the better value. Start with 2.5 and if it doesn't work, try the lower speed. If that doesn't work, complain to your coworker and go home for the day. The last concept to consider is the recording mode. The MCDS supports two recording approaches for the TCM, trigger mode and upload by sampling. Trigger mode allows dividing the TCM into a pre and a post trigger area. The MCDS writes trace messages into the pre trigger area in a round robin fashion until the trigger occurs. At that point, it starts filling the post trigger area until it is full and the debugger reads out the data. The user can specify the trigger with the trace done register in the MCX configuration tab. This capability of the MCDS enables powerful use cases like recording data for hours until a particular event or error occurs. We have demonstrated this use case in the previous webinar. However, we will keep it simple and configure trigger position to begin and trace done to always in this webinar. That has the effect that the MCDS starts recording once we hit the play button and simply records till all available tiles are filled. With the second approach, upload by sampling, the debugger manages the tiles. The idea is to tell the MC2S to write into one tile while the debugger reads another one. If the debugger can read out data face faster than the MCDS creates messages, this allows for continuous tracing. Upload by sampling is where a high DAP clock rate is beneficial and where the powerful filters of the MCDS become essential. Note that trigger mode works with all DAP clock frequencies, while upload by sampling only works with high DAP frequencies. Lastly, the recording mode for the HGBT interface is streaming. The HGBT controller streams out the data to the debugger. Note that even with the high speeds of the Aurora trace port, the FIFO can still overflow. Overflows can happen when recording code with tight loops or when one has configured the MCDS to record too much data, like full program flow trace for more than one core. Okay, enough theory. Let's go over the basic configuration in WinIDEA. In this example, I'm going to use a DAP active probe. First, I need to find out the MCDS clock frequency of the application. To do so, I open the Oryx Clocks plugin under View, Oryx, Clocks. The MCDS clock in this case runs at 150 MHz, which means I can set the cycle duration to 6.66 nanoseconds. To do so, I go to Hardware, CPU options and finally analyzer. Now I'm using the DAP active probe, which means the operation mode is on chip. Next, I switch to the SOC tab. Since I'm using the DAP active probe, I can set the DAP clock to almost 160 MHz. Let's just do that and hope that our hardware designer did a good job and that it works. Finally, you can see that the default trace buffer is TCM. Since my application does not use the TCM, I can leave that setting as it is. If my application was using the TCM, I could either uncheck use all available memory and specify a subset of tiles, or I could play it safe and switch the XTM, switch to XTM. Anyway, in my use case, I will leave the settings on TCM. Lastly, note that I could change the lane link speed in the Aurora tab if using HGBT. With the basic configuration in place, let's go back to the slides for a second to understand our first use case. Our first example is a simple application that simulates a temperature control loop. We are facing the issue that the actual temperature does not change when we update the reference temperature. 
our idea is to record a full broken flow trace of the core on which the control loop executes, in this case core 0. The application itself consists of two ISRs and two runnables. The runnables are not real runnables in the autosur sense, but simple functions that the application executes periodically. The 20 milliseconds runnable executes the control loop algorithm. And the 5 milliseconds runnable reads out the current temperature via the function ADC update and makes it available for the control loop. The 1 millisecond interrupt increments a counter. Based on the counter, the main loop executes the two runnables. Lastly, the ISR with the interesting name Tom Can generates a PWM signal. Tom Can executes with a very high frequency, so I could not be bothered to draw it into the timeline picture. Let's discuss the trace configuration before we go back to WinIdea to debug the issue. Since we want to record a broken flow trace, we have to use one of the processor observation blocks. Only POBs can observe the CPU instruction pointer via the program trace unit PTU. The PTU can filter the program flow data for specific memory ranges. However, in this example, we will record a full program flow trace, meaning we will not apply any filters and record all instructions. We record the data into the TCM from where the debugger reads the data via the DAP Active Probe to analyze it in WinIdea. As a side note, if you're not sure what PTU, POBs and POBs are about, we explain that in great detail in the first part of this webinar series. You can find the video on YouTube. For many use cases, the goal is to collect as much trace data as possible, and therefore upload by sampling is the preferred recording mode. The exception is use cases where we want to trigger on a specific event, like when the application ends up in a trap or when a particular value is written into a register. In this example, the challenge is that the program trace unit generates too much data. The tiles fill up before the debugger has a chance to read them out. Not even with the maximum depth clock frequency. Keep in mind that the PTU does not create a trace message for every program counter value. Only PC values whose corresponding instruction might change the flow of the program create a message. But even with that compression in place, the data generation rate is still too high for upload by sampling. Therefore, our best bet is to fill up all the tiles once and hope that the resulting trace is long enough to give us some insights. To do so, we set the trigger mode to begin and trace done to always. The effect is that the recording starts as soon as we hit the play button in the WinIdea analyzer. Or as soon as we run the application, which, um, whichever comes second. Once the TCM is filled, the debugger reads out the data automatically. The next consideration is time stamping. Since our problem might be timing related, we want timestamps to understand better what the application is doing. If we were solely interested in the functional behavior, we could also trace without timestamps to get more program flow data. There are two techniques for timestamp generation, relative timestamps and ticks. You will win notice that WinIdea configures relative timestamps by default, but I recommend using ticks in most cases, so that's what we're going to do. The exception is scenarios where an external trace, for example recorded by our, by our CAN add-on module, needs synchronization with the on-chip trace. Again, the previous webinar has an in-depth discussion of the two timestamp options. Now let's see how to configure the actual program flow trace. We use POB set to observe CPU zero. Note that this is the only CPU that POB set can observe. So we always want to map CPU 0 to set and save the other two POBs for the remaining CPUs. Lastly, we enable the PTU for POB set by setting PTU enable to always. We also will have to make sure that code profiling is active so that the Vinity analyzer knows that it has to profile and visualize the program flow data. Alright, let's do it in WinIdea. 
With the basic configuration already in place, we can start tracing right away. But first, we take a second to remind ourselves of the issues we want to debug. As you can see in the watch window, the application is running. Ideally, if I change the reference value, the control loop should generate an output signal so that the actual temperature value moves towards the reference value. Unfortunately, that does not happen. Maybe tracing can help us understand what's going on. To use tracing, we open the Winadier Analyzer. First we click on View and then Analyzer. It is best practice to create a new configuration for each use case. We do so by selecting the drop down button next to the hammer and then clicking Create a new configuration. We want to use the profiler but not coverage analysis. Using the wizard to get an initial configuration can be helpful, so let's do that. We select a process we want to observe, here CPU0, and we want to start recording as soon as we hit the green record button, so we choose trigger immediately. Finally, we want to record all program flow data. After we've clicked Finish, Winadier shows us the recorder view of the hardware trace configuration menu. Usually, I recommend disabling timer interpolation when using ticks as timestamp source. But we can leave it enabled because we use program flow trace. Note that this menu also allows us to enable upload based sampling. Let's move on to the MCDS configuration view. The on-chip trigger position is already set to begin, which is what we want. Under our MUX, we can map the POBs and POBs to the different peripherals, buses and CPUs. Note that there are only two BOBs, SI1 and 2, because the third POB always observe the system peripheral bus. Also note that PUZ already points to CPU0, which is again what we want. CPU0 is the only CPU available in that menu, so Winadia made an intelligent choice by choosing PUBZ. As I said, I recommend ticks for almost all use cases, so let's change the timestamp source to tick. We must then make sure that the MCDS generates tick messages, so let's switch to the MCX view to do that. As you can see, Winadia has configured relative timestamps. If you want to use relative timestamps, that setting is ok and you can leave it as it is. However, since we want to use tick based timestamps, we disable TSU rel by setting it to never. And then set tick enable to always. Trace done is already set to always, which is what we want. Lastly, we switch to try set to make sure that the PTU enable is set to always to enable the program flow trace. Again, Winadia has already made this configuration for us. We do not use TCX0, so let's change it to never. Ok, to recap. We have configured the trace device to start recording immediately until the trace buffer is full. We record an unfiltered program flow trace on, cons on core 0 and use ticks as the timestamp source. This completes the hardware configuration and we can close the menu. Now is an excellent time to save the workspace. With the hardware configuration complete, we just need to tell the profiler that it should profile the code for CPU0. To do so, we click the hammer symbol to open the active configuration. To enable code profiling, we first need to create a process for our CPU. We can then switch to the profiler configuration for that process via the menu on the left. Code profiling is already active, so we are good to go. There are some other interesting settings here, but we can leave everything as it is for our use case. Note that there is a video explaining the profiler in detail on our YouTube channel. Just to make sure that it is clear what we just did. 
First, in the hardware configuration menu, we told the MCDS which trace messages to record. You can see the raw data that is recorded in the trace view. I will demonstrate that in a second. However, to visualize the data in the timeline, we need to tell the profiler to profile the code. And that's what we just did in the second step. All right, time to record a trace. If the application is already running, we can start a recording by hitting the green record button. Alternatively, if the application is stopped, we can hit the record button first. And in that case, the trace recording starts as soon as the application is started. So let's start a recording. As expected, the trace memory fills up immediately and the analyzer profiles and visualize the data for us. If the timeline is empty, make sure that the code area is active. Also, use the zoom all button to show the trace over the entire duration. It can also help to hide areas with no activity to grasp the action better. If you still cannot see any data, the next step would be to examine the raw trace. The gray trace messages show the data in decoded form. We can activate on-chip trace data via the right-click context menu to see the raw messages. You can now see the red PTU and tick messages. Note that there might be one or more gray program flow events for a single PTU message. That is the direct consequence of the compressed program flow that we have mentioned earlier. You can double click on messages to show the respective location in the disassembly view. Okay, it's time to go back to the timeline and debug our issue. The timeline uses three colors, red, light red, let's call it pink, and blue. Red indicates that a function is active. Pink indicates that the function executes a subfunction or is preempted, either by an ISR or by an OS context switch. Unfortunately, there's no straightforward way to differentiate between the two. Lastly, blue indicates that more is going on and we have to zoom in to see what exactly is happening there. We can see that the ADC update is active almost the whole time which is not ideal. There could be a problem with the function itself, but let's take a look a little closer. The 5 millisecond runnable executes ADC update, and it seems like it runs more often than that. By setting the blue and yellow markers, I do that by holding control and pressing the left and right mouse button, we can quickly confirm that the period is lower than the expected 5 milliseconds. We know that the runnables execute based on the tick they get from the 1 millisecond OS timer ISR. So let's see if anything is wrong with that. And sure enough, it looks like the ISR executes every 100 microseconds instead of the expected millisecond. Maybe someone removed a zero from the counter preload value. Let me quickly fix that and come back. Okay, let's download and give it another try. When I record now, everything looks much better. You can see that the 5 milliseconds runnable has the expected period. And when I change the reference value, the actual temperature changes too. And with that, we have demonstrated the value of program flow tracing. Now, I admit that this is a simple example application with an artificial and somewhat silly issue. Nevertheless, silly problems occur in the real world and program flow tracing can help you resolve them quickly. We think that program flow trace on the Oryx is an excellent addition to every developer's toolkit. All right, and with that I give over to Matthias for the second use case of the day. Our second use case is artificial. To be more frank, 
we made it up. If you find similarities with previous experiences of yours, that is random and non-intentional. We will investigate on hidden hardware signals using trace if the software analysis does not help here. So we have this PWM that's jittering too much. How is this PWM generated? We have a cyclic interrupt triggered by a timer. This is triggering a DMA transfer to a pin to toggle its state. Quite an easy setup. In the software trace that is already configured from use case one, we should be able to see if our software is the problem in this case. In our software trace, we can see this Tom Ken interrupt service routine. This is the one toggling our um, PWM signal. And here, let's go into this. It looks quite periodic. Let's look by quickly measuring it with our left and right mouse button holding the control key. It's 51 microsecond. This one's also 51 microseconds. So that seems to be OK from my point of view. Because we did not want to move out of our chair, get an oscilloscope, and physically connect it, we did the lazy approach by just tracing the right access to the PWM pin to observe the edges of the signal. So we do it quite easily. We say at this port, uh, which is P33 in this case, we want to look at all the accesses to the output modification register. And it has this address here. So we are every time there is an access to this address, or more specifically to the address range on the left side, we take the data trace unit within the bus observation block SPB to generate a trace message. And this way we know exactly when um, the signal will go high or low. We could have selected a more elegant approach with Oryx, but that is a topic for the next webinar where we will look into this in more detail. So let's first do our trace configuration. We click on this hammer here to go into the current trace configuration. And since we want to set it up manually, um, let's look at the configuration. We're using the data trace unit. So we want a trigger whenever this address range here is written. Um, and here I chose the address range that is um, uh, containing only the output modification register of P33. Now we are generating a trace event on this trigger. That is event zero. We just select it by checking the box here. Select OK. And then what we want is we want to get all the written data to this pin uh, or to this register. Because every time this register is written, the output state of the pin is modified. So we say, if this event zero is active, I want to get all the data, so DTU. Uh, WDAT and DTU W um, ADR to get also the address that is accessed. Now I select OK. My trace is set up, but I won't see anything because what I need is to activate the data area in the profiler. That's a pure VIN idea configuration. And um, I can show you what I did. Usually you would select New. Now we select Edit and look at the configuration. So you give it a name. You tell the location, and the location is the address in the trace message, which in this case is the address of the output modification register. All else we can uh, leave on default, and then we click OK. We have our data area. We select OK, and then we can hit the green arrow for tracing. You can see the result is, um, is displayed here, and you can see that our PWM values are visible here. I select the drop down menu to see what possible values are written to this. And if we zoom out a little bit, we can already see that this period is quite long while this one is short. So we can quite clearly see the jitter. Now let's measure this quickly with the control holding the control button and left and right mouse button. This is 189 microseconds. And this one looks already much smaller. This looks like 102. So this is more than 80 microseconds of difference. 
that's clearly too much for a superior microcontroller um, like the Oryx. The question is, what is causing this behavior? Maybe it is the peripheral bus load? In our software, we are using many peripherals. It is a single bus, but um, how to check that? We will try to get an impression what the system peripheral bus load is by tracing all read and write accesses to the system peripheral bus. By visualizing this as a program exit entry variable instead of a state variable, we can, good, can get a good idea of the bus load already in WinIdea. So how does it look on the MCDS side, so on the trace system side? So we have the system peripheral bus where all the peripherals are connected. And whenever there is a transaction happening here, what we want is to get a trace message on the data trace unit of the bus observation block related to this. Now let's get to the configuration within WinIdea. So how do we need to change our configuration to look at all system peripheral bus transactions? We click on the hammer, add on configure since we want to change our manual configuration. And now what we want is all accesses, all read and all write accesses. So we don't need the trigger logic and the event logic to filter anything, but we want everything. So we want the write data, so we say always. So every write will um, issue a trace message. We are not interested in the addresses anymore. That saves also some trace data. But the read data is also important for us. So we also enable this with always. So now we will get a trace message for all read and write accesses containing the data that it has been read or written on the bus. We remember that we also need a um, a profiler data area for this and I've prepared one we call it SPB accesses its location is 0x0 since we are not logging the addresses win idea will will show 0 as the address for all those messages we say all cores the size is 32 bit since the bus has 32 bit and we say okay another okay and then we can go on to our trace Note that this is quite fast since I'm using the AGPT active probe. We are stopping it here. Now we can look at a huge number of possible values. Let's um, uh, not use this um, and look at a view more in detail. Blue parts here are bus transactions. So each transaction will generate a line here. And the red parts are um, parts where no change is happening or no transfer is happening on the bus. So we can see there are quite large areas where there is more red than blue. So we can see that probably the um, system peripheral bus load is not our main issue here. Where does this jitter come from? I'm using the DMA to transfer the value to the port register. So CPU load should not be an issue as we have also seen before. Maybe it has something to do with the DMA load. How do I look at the DMA utilization? Can I see my transfers in detail? Luckily, Oryx allows me to trace DMA transa transactions as well. We want to lock whenever the DMA activates one of its move en engines uh, and a channel and starts the transaction. And we want to take those signals on the OTGB and finally generate our trace messages using the processor observation block zero. The OTGB enables us to collect signals from peripheral modules directly into the trace system and append a timestamp to it. This way we get a kind of logic analyzer without attaching any wire externally. The bus has 32 bit width and there are two instances, OTGPM and OTGP. In the case, use case today, we are using only 16 of the 32 bits of OTGP for the DMA. Spoiler, in webinar number three of this series, you will see what the other bits could be used for. 
but focus back to DMA. The DMA has a trigger set. You have seen it before in the OTSS register configuration, which is the name of the data it will signal on the OTGB. This trigger set will output a 7-bit channel number, as you can see here, and an active bit here for each of the move engines. So we will know whenever a new channel transaction is started and is ended because each bit change will trigger a signal change on the OTGB. Enough of the theory, back to the configuration. For DMA tracing over OTGB, we need three registers to be written uh, in the device. So we have the first register is the DMA OTSS, where we need to tell the DMA to put its uh, set of signals to the OTGB whenever they are changing. So what we need to write here is a one to enable trigger the trigger set one to the OTGB zero. Then we have two additional registers, OMIS P and OMIS N. And here what we need to write is 0xf to make sure um, that the MCDS is sensitive to the OTGB changes um, and can generate trace messages on OTGB uh, changes and events. Let's adapt our configuration for the DMA tracing. We go into our configuration and we first disable the SPB um, observation block so we don't need all the things here from the SPB anymore. Now we go to the MCDS, we select OTGB for processor observation block X or zero. And for processor observation block Z, we select CPU zero, so we can keep all the software trays. We say PTU enable, program trace unit enable to always, so we still get the program trace through processor observation block Z. And with the processor observation block X, we configure the right data to always and the right address to always as well. Now we select OK. And now remember we need another data area. Uh, we don't need the SPB accesses anymore, so we configure a new data area. We name it DMA info raw. Location is 0x0 since on the OTGB it doesn't get an address and size is 4 bytes. Now OK, OK. And now we can do another DMA trace. We can see here that WinIdea gives us a quite huge list of different values and it is not very convenient to find what we are looking for. However, WinIdea also provides us with a tool to make this easier to use, the inspectors. That's this little button here. The inspectors are essentially a kind of configurable protocol analyzer that we can use to convert the raw data signals into more readable outputs. Describing how this is done would extend this webinar too much. The full tutorial is available through iSystem, but for now let us simply import the inspectors from the JSON files that I already created. Now we do a reanalyze on the blue play button. And um, we can now, if we expand the inspectors, we can now see that the two move engines, you see here, move engine one is active here. And this is the line for move engine zero active. Uh, and you can see this one's active and then this one gets active too and so on and so on. So they are overlapping. So the DMA load seems to be quite large already. So that means we need to either decrease the DMA load or take the CPU to write to the PWM port. What a nice surprise. There is a variable here that says use CPU data transfer. Let's set it to one. Probably then now it's using CPU 
instead of DMA. To be able to visualize this, we need our trace logic analyzer again um, to see what the PWM looks like now. And so we restore the configuration to see all the right accesses to the P33 pin. Here, what we want is we want to get the right data when this event is um, active. Remember, triggers for this event are generated whenever there's a write to the address range of this register. And we also want to get the address in the trace to be able to filter on this. Now we enable the SPB, uh, no, the P33.4 PWM data area again, and then we do another trace. Now let's look at this. You see, now this PWM looks way more stable than before. So obviously changing from DMA to CPU has uh, brought us a way uh, more stable uh, transfer time in this case. We could have also rearranged the DMA arbitration, but um, you, the main point here is that with this DMA trace, we, would, we were able to see quite quickly um, where our problem was. Thanks for demonstrating this use case, Matthias. Cool stuff. And with that, we are done with our presentation and demo. Thanks everybody for your time and attention. We now have time for questions and answers. All right, Felix and Matthias, thank you very much for the demonstrations, for demonstrating the use cases. And as I said, now it's time for some questions. And also don't forget to download the presentation by clicking the cloud symbol top right of your screen. Um, I would like to start with a question to a topic, Felix, you mentioned at the very beginning, you talked about DAP and AGBT. Um, I also know that ED devices offer a so-called DAP E interface. Is this also supported? What is the difference? Can you explain a little bit more about that too, please? Yes, yeah, maybe on the picture of the DAP Active Prop, you could see that there's like a second little ribbon cable coming out. So we support the DAP E interface that was introduced by Infineon for the second Oryx generation. And uh, the way we support it is, the, like if you have the DAP E activated, like in that menu that I showed, there's a checkbox to use DAP E. So if you have that connected to your target, and then the way we utilize it is that the regular DAP interface is used for bidirectional communication, for regular debugging, like setting breakpoints, reading out real-time watches, um, reading SFRs. And then the DAP E interface is solely used for tracing and with like the highest possible clock frequency. And the idea is then that you get full trace speed when like using these two interfaces um also some customers use like have like a little jumper board between the dub um inter like the dub connector on the debugger side and their target to like disable external watchdogs so that extends the distance between like the active pro for example and the physical dab connection on the microcontroller and in such cases uh, the consequence may be that that your maximum dab clock frequency becomes lower so if you still have the DAP-E interface available, you might not be able to run the DAP clock at the highest possible frequency, but the DAP-E. And so in that case, the, the DAP-E interface is a, a good option to get the highest possible clock rates. I don't know if uh, you have anything to add to that, uh, Matthias, from Infineon side, what, what you were thinking with the DAP-E interface, but that's at least how we use it at iSystem. Yeah, it, it's basically an extension for more bandwidth. Yep, short and precise. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the explanation, Felix. Um, I'd like to stick to the connections. Uh, one question was, when I start a record and I use AGBT, I sometimes have overflow, overflow errors. What does that mean? 
I, Felix, yeah, I, I, I can start with that one. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, we explained that like when when you use so HTTPD is the high speed uh, streaming interface, but uh, on chip is still like you have this XTM memory that is used as a FIFO, and like that um, on chip FIFO is the one that overruns. So this can happen, for example, if you have a very um, like low CPU load in your system and like your idle task is running. And like what the, the reason is that how the idle task is often implemented, there's a single while true loop. So that means in the code, there's basically a single jump instruction to itself. And if you maybe remember like how this compressed program flow trace works is that only messages are only generated for events that change the flow of the program. Now the problem is such a jump instruction is a change in the, is considered a change in the program flow. So you basically a while loop generates a lot of trace messages. And those trace messages like quickly overflow the FIFO and that's why you're getting this error. So the um, solution to this problem would be to find out where is this tight loop and then exclude that instruction or maybe one or two or three instructions depending how many there are and exclude those from the trace and then the um, overflow foot should disappear uh, my my colleague armin explains that in the first webinar of the series so if you check that out um, he explains it a little bit uh, more detail uh, one way to find out that address is simply to stop the debugger like multiple times see um, at which address you are and if you have like a, an operating system um, loop that is executed 70 percent of the time at some point if you stop a couple of times you will note you always end up uh, in, in that while loop and then you know okay that's the address that i have to include but that's the that's the reason for this hdvd overflow flow again i recommend watching the the other video where Armin explains it Yes, so go to YouTube, type in iSystem webinar, and you will find all webinars we have distributed in the past. Thanks, Felix, for that. Um, for a last topic, because we are slowly running out of time, I would like to come to the DMA analysis, Matthias. Is there a possibility to get the inspectors used for visualization? Yeah, I think that shouldn't be an issue. Um, um, I would suggest that um, you send an email to Felix <laughs> or myself. <laughs> um, of course, I prefer you send it to Felix. <laughs> uh, no, uh, just joking. It's uh, they, those are JSON files, and I'm sure we can share. Um, um, that's no problem. Yeah, just um, send us a, an email and. We can reply. I don't know, Sabrina, if we can also attach them to the video download somehow, um, or or put it to to the to the slides or whatever. Um, That's too spontaneous, honestly, uh, to attach it to the slides now. Um, I prefer we contact you and send the, or you contact us, uh, however, and um, we send it directly then. Yeah. So please yeah, contact us then. Yeah, you can also send it to webinar at isystem.com. So <laughs> then both guys don't have to do anything in the first step. <laughs> All right, um, we're running out of time. Uh, we are about to finish. So thanks, Felix and Matthias, for the demonstrations, for the Q&A session, for sharing knowledge with us. It was very interesting. Thanks again. And to all attendees, before you leave, please leave us your feedback in the polls, feedback form, and feel free to check out our online trace tutorial, the application notes, and of course, the YouTube channel we mentioned several times now. And if you want to also feel free to register to our newsletter, where you get webinar and product updates automatically. So if you come, if you have questions later, feel free to send them to webinar at isystem.com. All questions we were not able to answer now will be answered by email afterwards. And thanks again, Felix and Matthias. And one outlook, May 20th, we will have the third session of this Infineon iSystem 
Trico Aurix Trace Session, where we will discuss another use case. And Felix and Matthias will be here again. And for all Spanish speaking, people out there next week, next Thursday, April 1st, we will have this session too in Spanish language. So as I said, once again, thanks Felix and Matthias and take care and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. -bye.